Welcome to part two of our ongoing spring series, Conversations on the Datafied State. My name is Rigoberto Lara Guzman, and I am the lead producer for this uh, production, alongside my dear colleague, Nasa Lee, who will be behind the scenes. Let us open with our digital land acknowledgement. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different kind of network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. Today, we are here to uh, discuss our conversation on the datafied state. Uh, as governments procure, develop, implement and mandate the use of digital and computational systems, the state becomes ever more datafied. And the boundaries between public and private power and accountability are increasingly blurred. Our emerging research agenda, the datafied state, explores this growing impact of algorithms, automation, surveillance across civic life and the benefits and risks they pose to the public. Check out our, the series here on our website for more information. In part one of, of the series, uh, Director of Research Jenna Burrell framed the discussion around a single question. What exactly is the public interest? We trace the historical origins of the public interest technology field back to the mid 20th century public interest law movement. And as Professor Deirdre Mulligan said, quote, the public interest encompasses service, policy change, and an orientation towards justice, reminding us that the word public carries a distinct set of values different, but often entwined with the private sector. Professor Anne Washington also shared her experience in government data and invited us to think about the challenges and opportunities of designing technology for the 100%. Today's data bite focuses on the automated state and is being hosted by my friend and DNS researcher, Ranjit Singh, who will introduce our guests. Ranjit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rigo. Hello, everyone. In this part of the conversation, we are going to focus on automation as an ongoing imperative to reorganize state services, especially in the context of welfare. Broadly, we'll basically think about the question of how does automation mutually shape the organization of state services, and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Joanna Redden and Michelle Gilman, who will be joining us in this conversation. So to introduce them briefly, Dr. Joanna Redden is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies, Western University, and she's also the co-director of the Data Justice Lab. Her research focuses on the datafication of governance. She investigates how government information systems and service profession are changing the democratic implica uh, implications of changing government practices and how these transformations are affecting people. Dr. Michelle Gilman is a venerable professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law. She directs the Sowing, uh, Sow Ewing Civil Advocacy Clinic in which student attorneys represent individuals and community groups in a wide array of civil litigation and law reform projects. In addition, Michelle also serves as a co-director of the Center of Applied Feminism, which works to apply insights of feminist legal theory to legal practice and policy. I must add here that Michelle was also a faculty fellow at Data and Society, and she's the author of this wonderful Data and Society report on poverty logarithm. She recently also wrote a point for peace, uh, for uh, a, a piece for points. Uh, our research blog uh, on the challenges of identity verification in claiming unemployment benefits, which I'm sure will come up during our conversation today as well. So I would like to begin by inviting both Joanna and Michelle to talk a little bit about their own work in the space of automation 
and how you got to the point of thinking about automation and bureaucracy and how it shapes the experience of uh, state services in general. Uh, let's open with Michelle. All right, thank you, Ranjit. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm so happy that Data and Society is focusing on these issues. So as Ranjit said, I direct a law clinic. And that means that I'm still a practicing lawyer and I'm supervising students representing low-income clients in Baltimore. When I started about two decades ago, and we have a robust public benefits practice helping people access welfare, Medicaid, and food stamps, we were mostly dealing with frontline caseworkers, human beings. And while they had computers, those computers were really nothing more at that time than glorified typewriters. Fast forward through the years and more and more of the discretionary decision-making is now being made by the computer rather than a person. And so that's really how those issues um, just surfaced on my docket, <laughs> whether I liked them or not. And I had to contend, and my student attorneys all of a sudden had to contend with clients who were being denied benefits or having benefits cut, were struggling to get an explanation. Why is this happening? My client is eligible or my client is getting sicker. Uh, not being able to find out answers. And it was often not until we were in an actual hearing before an administrative law judge that we would find out, oh, it's because an algorithm made the decision here. And finding out in an actual legal proceeding that an algorithm is responsible is too late. <laughs> and it's very hard to cross-examine an algorithm because what we find is the experts brought in at those hearings to testify on behalf of the state have no technical expertise. They're usually a nurse or someone in the medical profession and they can't explain the algorithm either. So you have a judge, a state expert and, and a claimant who, who's suffering, has health needs or medical needs and no one in that room knows how the algorithm works. And yet that's the decision maker. So you can see yeah, when that keeps you know popping up in your docket, you know, I couldn't help but become engaged in these issues because these are the reality across the country of how social safety net benefits are now administered. Joanna? Oh, uh, yeah, hi, 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 yeah. So, um, right, where to start? Uh, so we, um, we came together at the Data Justice Lab been around 2016, and we have, we have, we, we bring together kind of a diverse range of um, research, uh, professional experiences, and then our own kind of um, working in, in communities in different kinds of ways, um, lived experiences. And we were, concerned about, well, I mean, anti-poverty, um, we're concerned about politics, we're concerned about surveillance. We saw all these things coming together in the way that some of these data systems are being developed. We started hearing about, um, you know, and learning more from research by others about how things are being implemented, but realized that there's very little work at that time, this is 2016, 2017, um, actually trying to document and study, particularly in the United Kingdom, which is where, you know, we were located at that time. Now we're kind of co-located, I guess, in, in different kinds of ways because of um, people moving. But um, yeah, we were concerned about the lack of information available. Um, I think because of our understanding of information power and the way that has played out historically and politically, um, we saw we had real concerns about what this was going to mean if we start to see government agencies increasingly taking up these kinds of systems in a way that affect people's life chances. So um, we started launching projects and we all work in different ways together and on our own on different kinds of projects. The first kind of set of projects really focused on trying to map and analyze what was happening. How were government agencies making use of this information, trying to share that information in a variety of ways, um, contribute to work being done by others, broaden the debate. Uh, we have done research documenting data harms, trying to understand where and how people are being negatively affected, and then what happens when people try to redress those harms. Uh, the, the recent work um, that I've been doing with some of my colleagues at the lab has involved researching canceled systems. So really trying to understand the factors that are leading to government agencies making the decision to stop using different kinds of systems. Um, and then we have ongoing work that has involved and continues to involve uh, thinking about and working toward greater civic participation. So how do we expand who's at the table when decisions are being made about if, where, and how these systems are being used? Um, and how do we kind of broaden um, and politicize some of these discussions? So that's, uh, I'll stop there. 
That's great because it kind of opens up the space of the different kinds of questions that we can start thinking about when it comes to automation. So in, in a very broad sense, automation is, is a way to replace people with machines. That's you know an underlying phenomena that we are trying to basically unpack here. And uh, the first question that I would like to ask both of you is kind of focused on uh, the way in which this push towards automation is justified. And there are quite a few explanations that are generally given, you know, ranging from efficiency as you know the reason to basically do some of this work, to uh, you know being able to actually think uh, along the lines of you know, oh, we are not making these decisions, the machines are. So hence, you know, this is not a political decision anymore. It's a it's a way to depoliticize decision making. So I wonder how, in your own work, have you seen, you know, especially in in the way in which defense organizes its own motions in, in terms of your work, Michelle, uh, how are they justifying investments in automation and how governments justify in your work, Joanna, uh, what it means to actually, why they're investing in this, in this kind of work. So um, as an opening, I would just be interested in learning from, uh, how is automation justified, Joanna? Yeah, so in the, in the research that we've done in the UK, one justification, I think, is as you mentioned, uh, Ranjit, is about you know cutting costs as a way of doing things more efficiently. I mean, that, I, and I just, I really, and I know we all know this, but I think it's important to say it um, right at the front is that there's a difference between what is said and then what happens in practice, right? So it, that's the caveat, of course, here. But that is the justification often for the use of these systems to cut costs. Um, there is sometimes an argument that these systems will enable. Um, organizations to become more efficient, will be able to identify people in need earlier. Um, there has been uh, claims made about the ability of these systems to provide the possibility for government agencies to intervene earlier. Um, and I think that there's also, um, there are justifications surrounding productivity, getting more out of people's working time. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and, and let Michelle maybe fill in some more. Sure, I hear those justifications as well. Another major one that comes up in my practice area is that human beings are biased and computers are not, so that therefore they're going to be inherently superior to you know, the frontline social worker or the judge determining the case. And there's no doubt that humans have all sorts of both conscious and unconscious biases, but it is a complete and utter myth that automating these decisions solves for that problem. And you know that notion that Meredith Broussard has called techno chauvinism, I run into that a lot. So we'll be before judges who just assume because a computer said so, it must be right. Um, that's a phenomenon sometimes called automation bias. Whereas the reality is that these algorithms are designed by people. It's a multi-step complicated process. And at every step, there are human judgments and human values being embedded in algorithmic design. Um, and there are so many ways that pre-existing individual biases and more significantly structural and historical biases get embedded into algorithms. And so a lot, <laughs> you know, my mission as a frontline legal services attorney is an educational one because I have to educate the judges that I appear before um, about something that goes against the conventional wisdom. It's not easy. And even my fellow legal services lawyers aren't necessarily aware of how algorithms are designed. We don't study that in most law schools. And so there's just a huge <laughs> educational effort that um, has to happen around these issues. Um, we also have the problem that when these algorithms uh, translate legal code into computer code, a lot of mistakes get made. I mean, if you've ever opened the Code of Federal Regulations around Medicaid, for example, it's incredibly complicated. You know, my law students will spend hours poring over these regulations to determine what they mean. And so often they're handed to a computer coder and says, code this. And they don't have the training to understand the regs. Many of the regs are ambiguous. They have gray areas. And there have just been thousands of instances in which they've been mistranslated and people have lost 
benefits that they need. People have gotten very sick. People have even died from this. And it's really a transfer of democratic accountability from the state to a private contractor, <laughs> you know, when you ask them to translate legal code into computer code. So <laughs> this, there's too much faith in the accuracy of algorithms. That's part of their selling appeal. That's what vendors are marketing. Um, but when you're on the ground, you just really see that it's not true. Right. Uh, also, it kind of uh, kind of brings up this interesting, uh, and you know, um, element of the research that I have been doing on uh, India's biometric based identification number, where the justification for some of these work have is usually focused on corruption. Uh, at one point of time, famously, one of the major uh, politicians in the country basically said that, you know, out of every uh, rupee that is spent on welfare by the government, only uh, a quarter of it actually reaches the population. And that, to a certain extent, is justified uh, in terms, uh, is offered as a justification in terms of thinking about, okay, because there is so much corruption, machines would not be corrupt, and hence we can basically invest some of these resources into basically building this machinic way of thinking about delivering welfare in the first place. Joanna. Well, I have a question for you both actually, but I, 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 just to add to that, I kind of, the, the one thing I wanted to note was that the thing that's not explicitly said as a justification, but I think is really important. And it's, it's what Virginia Eubanks found in her investigations in the US, what we found in our investigations in the UK is that this austerity context, right? This context of cuts um, to services that kind of put government agencies in this position where they want to believe that they can do, you know, that, that this is this kind of system might enable them to do more with less, right? But of course, we certainly find that's often not the case. But um, before we move into um, some, some of those examples, I wanted to hear from both of you about the kinds of systems you're seeing people using. And you just mentioned one there, Benji, but I just wonder if you could talk, talk us through a little bit the kinds of systems you're seeing and kind of what's happening on the ground. Absolutely. Um, so in, the, in, in what I've been observing, especially in the use of biometric numbers in India has been this particular way in which the number becomes the ground for not only verifying identity, so, you know, you have to authenticate your identity in order to basically be able to access welfare. But also it kind of created this new process by which you are basically claiming that you are eligible for welfare. And how it works is that you have to connect your unique num identity with a government database uh, for welfare services. And once that connection is established and you have claimed that this particular record, which is in a welfare database belongs to me as a beneficiary, it is only then that I can actually claim welfare through that data set in a way. So in that cross connection, what happens generally is that, uh, you know, it's a new way for the government to evaluate whether you are eligible for welfare in the first place or not. And some of these decisions kind of lend in, uh, into a conversation around, okay, you seem there are these conditions that you need to fulfill in order to be eligible for welfare. They're usually very complicated and it creates a new set of administrative burdens around trying to prove that you are eligible for welfare in the first place. And then to a certain extent, verify your identity every single time you're trying to claim welfare. Uh, and this kind of creates a wide variety of challenges on the ground because one of the great stories that I heard from one of the activists around right to food in India was basically focused on how, uh, you know, in remote places in the country, there are these uh, places where there's no network so the assumption is that in order for you to authenticate yourself for which you, you need network, you have to basically walk up a hill, authenticate yourself on top of a hill, then come back to the uh, fair price shop in order to claim your subsidized food rates. So you literally have to walk up a hill in order to be able to actually access welfare. And this form of backend work is essential in the, in the way in which uh, you know, people kind of make these systems work for them. Uh, despite the fact that they are seemingly automated, there's a lot of invisible work that goes into actually making these systems work. Michelle. Well, some US-based listeners may say, oh, we can't possibly have those problems in the US, walking, you know, having to walk up the hill to access the internet. But I have to say, I'm seeing a lot of the same issues Ranjit is talking about here in the US now um, as a condition of accessing various government services and public benefits, identity verification is required. And 
we don't have a nationwide system of identity verification as, as India does. It's very piecemeal here and fragmented state, local, federal, various agencies. So that's one issue we're contending with. But I also see these issues around what I call design justice that Ranjit is getting at. Um, during the pandemic, so many um, of my clients lost work due to COVID and were applying for unemployment insurance. And unemployment insurance platform, pretty much nationwide now in each state is an electronic platform, but it was not designed with the needs of the 100% um, in mind at all. And it just seems like some software programmers were, were in a room designing it without any input from stakeholders or ideas what stakeholders' lives are like. So at least in my state, the designers of our state UI platform assumed that all claimants have a desktop or laptop. That's not true. Many low wage workers access the internet in the United States solely through their smartphones. And yet the platforms weren't designed to be fully accessible on a smartphone. For full accessibility, you had to be on a computer. Um, they assume that everyone has reliable internet access, which we don't yet have in the United States. Uh, assume that folks applying are literate, that they speak English, that they're also digitally literate, you know, sophisticated users who can scan and crop and upload all sorts of identity documents. And it's just those assumptions of privilege that were embedded in the design of these systems are not the reality for many of my clients. And so the people who most needed the benefits couldn't get them at a time of, you know, international crisis. So, um, that, that has been very, very frustrating, um, which sort of leads to my question for you both, seeing various on the ground uses, and I'd love to hear from Joanna about other on the ground uses that you're seeing, are they working? What are the benefits? What are the harms? Yeah, so I think um, in the, in the, the data harm record, we've kind of compiled, I mean, there is such a huge amount of research, I think, a really valuable work that people are doing in different parts of the world, including so many people in the States, you know, uh, documenting where and how people are being negatively affected, that, that we've got some of that published in the, the data harm record. In the research that we're doing on canceled systems, we're seeing um, harms that are connected to, I think, risk assessment or predictive systems, these kinds of systems that are making inferences about people, the likelihood of what people will or will not do, um, which is hugely problematic. And there's a lot of research now demonstrating how hard it is to do that. And in fact, it's, it's you know, they're finding that systems that are predictive aren't that effective at all, actually. Um, and I can put some of this in the chat, maybe after we're done, we're done talking some of this recent research, but just for, just for an example, I mean, the Center for What Works in Children's Social Care in the UK, they did a study where they actually piloted and made very transparent um, research that they were doing to identify just how, how effective machine learning was at predicting the likelihood that somebody would abuse and neglect their children. And they found that these systems weren't that effective. And in fact, they make the suggestion that anyone who wants to put in place a system in an area where there's such a, um, a high impact on people's lives um, and life chances should be pushed to prove effectiveness, right? Um, and I think another case where we're seeing a lot of harms, and I know this is something that we all talked about um, briefly um, a little while ago, is connected to fraud detection systems. And I know something, this is uh, something, Michelle, you've been working on quite a bit. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of harms as connected to the use of fraud detection systems, automated fraud detection systems that are um, sending out notices that someone is guilty of committing fraud, wrongfully so. We, I mean, these systems have caused massive human destruction in Australia, in the US. Um, you know, they've been challenged legally in other parts of the world as well, effectively so. I mean, I, I have, there are harms connected with uses of facial recognition technologies um, and the research by Tim Nitke-Brew and Joe Bloom when he so effectively demonstrates the intersectional harms that are, that are connected to the uses of these technologies, you know, harms connected to wrongful arrest as just one example, harms connected to predictive policing. I'll stop there. I'll hand over to, to you, Ranjit, and then I'd love to hear uh, what you're seeing, Michelle, on this too. This is great. It's, it kind of brings up the need for the kind of work that um, is required to build a vocabulary around the way in which we think about these harms and the way in which some of the ways uh, in which these harms manifest on the ground are so difficult to actually capture. 
uh, because they're operational at a scale where you, know, you only see particular instances of it. Uh, I remember distinctly when I was doing field work in India, uh, a lot of the activists were struggling with basically quantifying the impact of what automation does uh, to delivery of welfare, especially in the context of subsidized food grains. And uh, they initially started to basically think about, okay, we can possibly match what people were eating before automation began and what, what they're eating now as a way to match this difference in consumption patterns and be able to say something about the kinds of ways in which people are struggling. But at the same time, you know, if you think about it a little more, you kind of realize that you don't remember what you ate yesterday. So how can you actually start mapping consumption patterns based on how people are responding to questions of what they were eating six months ago, for example. So all of these things to a certain extent kind of create this particular set of challenges of how to can we quantify these harms because they're kind of different for everybody, but at the same time, they're similar. And that, you know, experience of difference and their similarity across different contexts might be something that we will have to think a lot more as we kind of think through some of these challenges of how do we build a typology around this. And I'm sure Michelle would have a lot to say about this, given that she's working on specific cases in this space anyway. Yeah, I mean, to me, the harms appear very concrete because I have a client in need and their need isn't being met <laughs> or it's only being partially met or they're falsely accused of fraud or, um, they can't even access the system in the first place. So to me, it's very concrete. And I think it, to me, it would be very easy to build a typology and beyond that, I want strategies for fighting, for fighting it, not just identifying it. Um, I'll mention another example that, that's new since Rajiv brought up the example of food. So in the United States, um, one positive development during the pandemic was the federal government loosening requirements and allowing people using SNAP benefits, which are commonly called food stamps, um, to purchase food online, right? So that's an example of a technology meeting the moment. But here's the rub. <laughs> and that is that the retailers and vendors that are accepting online SNAP benefits now are gathering just huge troves of data about users. And remember, these are economically vulnerable populations. And so they know now like who the users are, where they shop, their locations, their browsing history, you know, and so much more information. And there's a concern now that these um, users are being bombarded with targeted advertising that can be quite manipulated by the big food industry, which is pushing food that, you know, isn't the healthiest choices. Um, in addition to the ad targeting, there's the concern about where these data troves are going to be sold. You know, will they affect someone's ability to get health insurance? Uh, will they be sold to predatory financial services? So I think this is also a good example that we can't quite separate the public and the private because they're increasingly intertwined because this is a social safety net program that is just you can't disentangle it from the, the private aspect of it. And there's so many other examples where we have this blurring between the public and private, which raises um, a lot of issues around legal remedies because our due process rights that we think about with the constitution only apply in the United States, only applies against the government, not private entities. And so as so many governmental functions get shifted over to the private sector, including even the you know, design and operation of eligibility systems, we have serious questions in the US about what, what rights uh, attach to those uses. Absolutely. Uh, this kind of uh, brings up two things. One is, of course, uh, Joanna, you mentioned in passing uh, your study on cancel systems. And I'm curious about cancel systems mostly because, you know, the broader question that I want to ask both of you is kind of focused on uh, what is recourse here? What is, uh, how do we understand and think through questions of justice in this space, uh, given that, you know, there is, a, there is an increasing articulation of the kinds of harms that automation is causing, then the, the broad question that I have is where do people go in order to challenge automation? And uh, maybe you could start with talking about cancel systems and then kind of respond to the question itself. Yeah, I, I think these are really, really important questions and questions that I think we should be talking about a lot more, a lot more widely because they're gonna get us thinking 
hopefully working toward the kinds of futures that we want, because um, obviously what we've got right now is not what we want. And so I think what, what has been, um, and, and it's important because, you know, this, this is tragedy, right? We're talking about human tragedy and it's, um, it's uh, you know, we're talking about systems in the worst cases that are devastating lives of, you know, thousands and thousands of people, right? Um, and so in that context, I think what has come out of the canceled research that is, a, is what I would see to be a positive, and I think it's really important to remember, is that there's a lot of struggle in and around the systems. There are a lot of competing visions, competing politics, competing values. Um, and we're seeing those struggles. That is certainly that is what comes out in the canceled system work. The problem is that the struggles, can, it takes too long to um, correct a system once it's in place, right? Legal challenges are, are successful. They are being successful in a number of cases in different parts of the world on different bases. But that takes a really long time, which is something Rashida Richardson points out so well in her work. Um, and so we have to think about how do we, as you know, Karen Young argues, how do we prevent <laughs> the kind of harms that we're seeing happening. How do we, um, how do, we do that? Okay, so what we're seeing in, in the canceled system research is politicization is working um, in that, that we see a number of preemptive bans or moratoriums um, on uses of different kinds of technologies, for example, facial recognition technology. That happens through community mobilization, through politicization. Um, we're seeing one of the things that was cited as being really successful in the case of the Netherlands with the, the the risk scoring system that was in place there is um, the lawyers involved in the legal challenge uh, credits mobilizing the public. So getting out, having, having um, meetings with people where these systems are in use, shifting public opinion, right? Um, and that worked to shift the mayor's opinion, which that, and, and then kind of led, led to a broader um, engagement. Critical media investigation is super important. And we and our, our, our canceled system report has so many examples of reporters out there doing the work and making visible what's often invisible. So the kind of, they're doing the work kind of documenting what's happening and then doing the impact work that people implementing these systems should have done in the first place, right, before they implement the systems. So they're actually going out and you know, working with um, people to kind of better understand how people are being negatively affected. I mean, I'll stop there, but those are just some um, some examples of, I think, um, recourse. And I'll, uh, Michelle, I'd love to hear what you have to say and you too, Renju. Well, I agree with everything that you said there. Um, lawyers are getting better at litigating these claims, but even when you win one of these cases, your clients have already been harmed. They've already suffered. And the harms can be quite life and death and stature. So I could not agree more that we need more ex ante solutions, more things that are preventative. I feel in so many of these systems, my clients are being used as guinea pigs. I mean, the state buys some software package, <laughs> rolls it out. There was never any testing. And it's like, well, let's see what happens. And we shouldn't be using citizens as guinea pigs in the system. There's so much we can do in terms of um, algorithmic impact assessments. I know data and society is you know, working hard on fleshing out what a robust impact assessment might look like, um, requiring audits throughout the life cycle of different algorithmic systems, um, bringing stakeholders to the table again through the entire life cycle of these systems. So I don't think it's some of these problems are so easily avoidable. That's what's really so heartbreaking when I see some of these harms. You know, if someone had just sat in a room with the end users of, you know, identity verification system, for example, so many of the problems we had would have would have been avoided. Um, but I think because these are marginalized communities, um, they the state is willing to use them as guinea pigs in a way they wouldn't for other users. You know, one thing I'll note is um, with regard to identity verification is, <clears throat> again, during the pandemic, there was so much need and demand on UI systems in the US and a vendor called IDB became very popular among states. They were entering, like at least 27 states entered contracts with this vendor while users were saying, it's not working for me. It's crashing. I can't reach a human being. And there was really an outcry among 
unemployment insurance users. But it wasn't until the IRS said they were adopting ID me that all of a sudden Congress people started speaking out. Um, journalists really started taking it to task. And so I just think with that one example, we see that who is impacted matters in what sort of mobilization happens. Absolutely. And just to add to this conversation, I think one of the most interesting challenges in this space is that, you know, these systems are basically taken on without any form of bug reporting policy in place in order to be able to say that, you know, this system is not working for me for one reason or the other. In the Indian context, there was this whole set of conversations which were kind of focused on this system, this biometric system is being used by 1 billion people, and yet uh, the organization that runs it does not have a bug reporting policy at all. And as I was thinking through this, you know, it's, it's seemingly, you know, in the appropriation of all of these technologies, there seems to be a way by which, uh, you know, any form of complaint that you want to make to the system requires you to go through a, a set of hoops around, you know, who do I contact? How do I reach a person to whom, with whom I can actually have a conversation about this? And in that moment, the, the, the challenge also becomes about, you know, uh, a lot of uh, people who are kind of interacting with you just simply tell you that I want to help you, but this computer won't let me, right, in a way. Uh, and that, to a certain extent, brings up another set of challenges in terms of thinking about where do people go and, you know, how, to a certain extent, the amount of time that it takes for it, it the entire complaint to go through the legal process is already, we've already lost the battle if we are kind of in that point, at that point, you're absolutely right, Michelle. So uh, on this note, I guess uh, it's time for us to take a couple of audience questions. Uh, and uh, we have some very interesting ones right from the beginning of uh, you know when the conversation began. I think this question almost immediately came up. Uh, so the first question is uh, asked by Josh Wells. Uh, Along with the crisis of misguided faith in vendor-based algorithms, I wonder if the speakers could discuss how they have seen any efforts at demanding accountability for those errors from vendors or agencies themselves. So this is a question primarily about, you know, can we demand accountability from the private sector when they're basically providing services uh, that the state should be providing in the first place? Well, I think Joanna's examples of these canceled contracts is a good example of that. I mean, one of the real barriers to demanding accountability from sort of my perspective, just at the very ground level, is just the lack of transparency. It can be really hard to find out until the horror stories start, you know, coming across the threshold that um, an agency has even adopted one of these tools. Um, I don't know, like, what's in the procurement contract, how many companies bid on it. There's just, it's, it's, I mean, we use often the term black box to talk about what happens within algorithms, but to me, the black box is the whole procurement system as well. Um, and so oftentimes we don't know um, that an automated decision-making system is, is at play here. And then even if you do know and you ask for it, we could be hit with trade secrecy defenses by the state or by the vendors. Uh, so you can't get your hands on it. And even if I can get my hands on it, sometimes, you know, it's, often too complex for a lawyer to understand. I would have to work with experts, which not all legal aid lawyers have access to that level of expertise. And I know that some algorithmic systems are so complex, even an expert would struggle struggle to explain it. So you have like these kind of like three layers of transparency barriers before you can even talk about accountability. But yes, as Joanna points out, we have seen efforts at accountability, but we also have to um, open the black box and have a lot more transparency because without transparency, you can't have accountability. Yeah, and I think we have to think about changing institutional processes and democratic processes as well. So I think that, um, right. So I think that we need to um, be thinking about um, the need for those promising what the what these systems will do or, or not do. I mean, I think as I mentioned before, there has to be a proof. There must be an, a requirement to prove effect, effectiveness, a requirement to prove 
um, no harm, but also I think something we don't talk about enough, and now that there's so much research documenting harm, there needs to be a means for those promoting the use of these systems to account for their history and to account for the way in which they're not going to do what has happened. And I mean, if we think about, I mean, the fraud detection stuff, I mean, these things have gone wrong in so many places, and yet they're still being used, right? And so we need to, we need to have some sort of mechanism in place to, for that to happen. And some of the things that have been recommended, for example, is that there, I mean, there's a lot of call for registries, but, you know, the, the one that the shadow task force for the automate, for the um, algorithmic, the New York City algorithmic task force, the shadow report, um, they have a whole set of recommendations in, in and around um, kind of making sure that we've got robust kind of auditing um, and registries and, and ongoing things like that. Um, and then I think was the other thing, there's so many things. Um, I'll, I forgot. I'll turn over to you, Ranjit. There's, yeah, I could go on. No, I, I think it's really important to actually think about, you know, given that we are in a space where automation could potentially have a sense of its own history, it's important that we kind of take that history into consideration when we are basically building out these systems and thinking about what it means to actually uh, think through some of the ways in which, um, you know, uh, these auditing of these systems need to be continuous with, a, with, a, with an eye towards what has gone wrong previously so that we can basically at least to some extent account for you know these are the ways that this system did not work and you know at least the problems that we encounter in the future are new ones rather than the old ones that we already know about you know, right so there are clear ways by which we can basically say that there are certain things that we could not have known when we are basically using these systems but at the same time there are clear there is clear evidence now that there are certain things that you know we know do not work in the context of automation for a wide variety of reasons and we should be able to account for them when it comes to appropriating these technologies. Which kind of brings me to, uh, you know, Michelle's point she raised initially, and it's also kind of turned into a question by Ben, which I think is an important one to think with. Um, so Ben Gansky asks, uh, thinking about Professor Gilman's point about the errors introduced in translating legal code into technical systems, I'm reminded of Denmark's push to alter the way they write legislation in order to be more amenable to this kind of machine translation and enforcement. So, you know, do you change the machine or do you change the law is more or less the question here. Uh, and uh, broadly, the idea, you know, of what's being asked is what are the risks and stakes that are, uh, you know, at, uh, here in attempting to limit our legal systems to machine legible laws. That is such a profound and important question and so much to think about there. You know, on the one hand, I admire the attempt to bring greater clarity to law because that itself is an act of transparency and accountability, even if it's never you know, translated into computer code. But to me, the idea that you can limit the legal system to only machine legible laws and judgments is not realistic. You might be able to capture, you know, like 80% of cases with, with using that methodology. But what about the edge cases, the non cookie cutter cases, the complex cases? So much of um, law and legal determinations is around credibility, right? When my client says she can't bathe herself, someone has to decide are they truthful? Do I believe that? Like, so much is about credibility and a computer just can't judge credibility. So it's hard for me to see that you could resolve all cases through greater legal legibility. There's, you always have to have a human in the loop or some process available for the outlier cases. I don't see any way to ever get rid of that. Well, and I just, I mean, the law changes as, as societal attitudes change and shift too, right? And, and so I think, um, yeah, I, I think I, that that's a big concern, and certainly what in the in the research that we've been doing, we see, you know, um, particularly this does this doesn't relate to kind of making these things legible, but it just relates to the legalness or the legality surrounding the use of these systems in the first place, which gets us back to the subject, I guess, or the previous conversation. But it's like they're they're being challenged in ways that were unanticipated, I think, and successfully so, and on different bases, um, and so in different places. And so, yeah, I think that, um, I think I think if we think about the use of these systems, um, their public attitudes are shifting um, and they're shifting pretty quickly. Absolutely. And I think this is, 
this is an interesting question also because it kind of involves and requires us to basically think about whether there is a possible translation between law and code, which is, you know, there's a lot of argument around it that, you know, law is code or code is law. Uh, but at the same time, if you kind of look at it as a profession, as, you know, we've talked about it last time as well, where, uh, you know, public interest technologists should actually be professionalized the same way as public interest lawyers, right? And there is clearly a way by which there's a sort of an argument being built here, which is kind of centered on what is the relationship between these two domains of practice, especially in the context of the state, uh, which is which is not the same. Like, they're not the same. They can't potentially be the same because they require very different kinds of expertise. Uh, and they require different ways in which we kind of think about administration of the state in general. Uh, so, you know, I personally, I think that, you know, I like the idea that we can start thinking about how we translate between these two domains. But at the same time, I wonder if you could speak a little bit towards um, the difference in expertise and how, you know, this the work that we are doing here, especially in thinking about automation, requires us to basically be experts in a lot of different domains to be able to actually talk about what's really happening in this particular moment. Uh, and uh, how have you tackled this question of having to know about administration, about code, about you know, somebody's experience uh, and you know, qualitative research, all of this together to be able to deal with you know, the question of trying to critique digital systems that are producing harm in a way, which also kind of connects to one of the questions that we have in the panel. Yeah, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. I think it's such an important point and we definitely could do more to have collaboration um, between public interest lawyers and technologists. That would be very powerful and needs to happen. Um, as a lawyer, we often have to deal with expert topics outside of our legal training. That's just like inherent in being a lawyer. I mean, Outside of the issues we've talked about today, I've had to learn about lead exposure levels and what's safe or not, or different psychological disabilities affecting children in order to get them special education services. And I could go on and on, but to be a lawyer is to inherently have to litigate and understand issues out of your expertise. How do you do that? You work collaboratively with experts, uh, you educate yourselves, you have them educate you, and it is very collaborative. And so on the one hand, that might be new in the world of the datafied society, but to a lawyer, we are trained to work with experts. How to, um, again, using that word translate, translate what they say into a way that a judge or jury will understand. And lawyers have been doing that you know, for decades and decades and decades. So I see this as just another domain where we have to gain expertise. And that's part of my pitch to my fellow legal services lawyers. Don't be intimidated by this, you can do it. You've done it many, many, many times before. And just because you the world algorithm and it's scary and you didn't study computer science in college you can do this um because it's very hard to lawyer at all without running into other domains of expertise it's just what the practice is like i think yeah i mean in terms of our research approach i think that we we work as we, we collaborate as well we work as teams and i think that's really helpful and i think we we've taken the approach of trying to combine breadth and depth. So we try to, um, you know, build on the work of others, contribute to conversations. And then I think in part by, you know, because we're a research institution, like we're all, we all work at universities, we have, we have those kinds of, you know, public resources when we're able to get them. Um, so we can kind of do the digging, compile the, and we can do the mapping stuff that we talked about, for example, which takes a lot of time. I mean, we filed for one of our research reports, we filed like 423, freedom of information requests, right? So, you know, we do the, we do the breadth thing and then kind of make all that information publicly available. But we also do depth. So we do case studies and we do qualitative work where we talk to people who are work, working in different ways, whether those be developers or people working in government or activists or um, lawyers. And we try to try to get a sense of what's happening on the ground through that kind of qualitative work. And I think though, those are the approaches that we've been taking. And then I think we also have been very fortunate with the community that we're part of, the larger community. So we have, you know, we go to conferences and things like that, but we also hold events like the Data Justice Conference. You know, a lot of people come in from different parts of the world and present the work that they're doing that inspires us. Um, the Big Data and the Margin series here at Western, we kind of brought different kinds of people together um, to talk about what they're doing, the kind of thing you guys are doing. 
<laughs> um, I love this series. So uh, yeah, how about you, Ranjit? How do you how do you do it? Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, the, the original idea behind actually thinking about the data fight state and building a sort of a collaborative experiment around thinking about what are the issues that are, that are at hand and how do we actually frame questions around it was basically designed to be to simultaneously keep it broad enough that everybody feels as if they can potentially have a way to contribute to the kind of work that is required in thinking about these, uh, you know, major issues uh, that are currently confronting us. But at the same time, it was also uh, an attempt to basically uh, think through what different forms of these collaborations would look like, right? So part of the work right now is to basically start this conversation and start building towards thinking about, okay, what are the different ways in which we can actually have a say in these matters? Uh, you know, how do we actually start thinking about building a collective around this? Uh, what, does, what would that collective look like? Uh, how do we actually start uh, thinking about the different forms of expertise that's required in order to contend with any of these issues that we are actually looking at in, on the ground? Uh, and that to a certain extent comes from not only doing the kind of qualitative, slow research building work uh, ourselves, but also then ensuring that there are you know, enough people that we are in conversation with that allows us to actually have a broader spectrum of uh, these conversations as they're happening across the world, right? So it's also the question of breadth versus depth, in a way, right? How do how deep do we go into a particular sector, a particular implementation of a technology, uh, and uh, you know the different people who are trying to contend with it, vis-a-vis -vis how you know broad do we want to go in terms of you know a broader uh, take on what does it mean, for example, uh, what does implementation of automated child welfare services looks like across the US or across the world, or what does it look like in a particular county in, 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 in a particular state, right? These are two very different questions, but they, they simultaneously require attention. And I think that's the important challenge here to think with and work out, uh, especially in the context of the kind of difference in expertise that is required in order to do some of this work. Um, so I am uh, going to ask one more question that we have uh, in the list. Uh, because we're kind of nearing the end of our uh, uh, data byte session in this conversation, which has been fantastic. Um, there's a question about Joanna, uh, and she mentioned, and Joanna, you mentioned that pushing for a justification of efficacy before adopting automated decision, uh, decision making systems in the public sector. Now, in Alex Liu's personal research on predictive policing systems, designers of these algorithms often offer accuracy as a metric to think about. Uh, you know, what does it mean to actually justify the use of this technology? I've also seen academia and police department partnerships that run experiments of these algorithms to show whether these uh, algorithms work in the field or not. So on that note, I'm curious about how decision makers and public officials currently justify the efficacy of algorithmic systems. What do decision makers consider effective algorithms? What are their shortcomings? And what are the holistic forms of just uh, what does holistic form of justification look like, right? Uh, which I think is an important question, which uh, you know brings me to the question that I also wanted to ask you as, as as we kind of come to an end to this conversation. What does success look like in the context of automation? How do we actually start thinking about uh, the ways in which you know these technologies are currently being becoming a part of our everyday lives, and what is successful automation? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm really glad you made that distinction about accuracy that, and, and it's true. And I think it's, I think at the, the arguments for accuracy or the arguments about there are, it's really problematic because the, as a justification, sometimes these accuracy rates um, and the way in which they are promoted, well, look, our system's pretty accurate. Well, if, if you, if you know about the way that um, policing is biased, has a, there's a history of discrimination in a particular kind of context, then and you know that you know, um, you know, if you're black or indigenous or person of color, you're you're going to be disproportionately targeted and more negatively affected. 
you have a very different understanding of whether or not that accuracy rate is good enough, right? Which is, I think, um, accuracy rate and, and arguments about effectiveness are really, really political because often they also don't take into consideration what the impact and the unintended consequences of those kinds of systems are going to be, which gets, which gets me to your bigger question, which is what does, um, you know, I guess what what kind of thing are we looking for? Um, and I think the kind of thing that we're looking for is a recognition that, um, a recognition, I guess, in terms of process, but in terms of uh, politics, that these systems are part of much longer histories and where, and I think Michelle was getting, well, we, we've kind of all been talking about the different places these are being introduced, but they're being introduced in areas where there is always, already a lot of inequality, a lot of uh, histories of systemic injustice. And so, and we can't disconnect our conversation from this and, and the our understanding and assessment of these applications without putting them within their wider context, which is they're just going to exacerbate this unless we do something about the systemic injustice in the first place, right? And so that's why I think it comes back to making sure that we link up our discussions to these longer histories, recognizing the way in which these systems exacerbate already existing inequalities, and recognizing also that, that these, these, these conversations are political. Um, and uh, I'll shift it over to Michelle now, I guess. Right, I think that's such an important point. I'm certainly not <clears throat> advocating, oh, let's go back to the old days of human-based prejudice and bias, but you know, the automated decisions are being sold to us as inherently superior and they're not. And the unwarranted faith in them is creating an extra layer of problems on top of already existing historical injustices. So for me, when you ask about a marker of success, at, you know, on a professional level, it would be, you know, not being inundated with clients who are wrongfully being denied benefits, wrongfully can't access a system because it's not designed with their needs in mind, who aren't wrongfully being accused of fraud and so forth. But at a broader level, as a member of society, it would be when citizens feel like they're being treated fairly by the state um, with minimal hassle. I really think these systems need to a lot of them have a fraud first presumption, probably because they are um, dealing with marginalized people for whom that kind of fraud first presumption has long existed. And we need to flip that to a presumption of legitimacy, like assuming that a citizen comes to the state with a legitimate claim. And just sort of the way we built these systems around a fraud first presumption is deeply, deeply problematic. And so overall, what I would like to see are these tech tools should be built to empower people and not oppress them. And that's not what's happening right now, but that sort of, that would be my marker of success. Is it empowering people? Yes, we want it great. If it's, if it's um, oppressing them in any way, then it needs to be either canceled as Joanna's talked about or changed dramatically or revised dramatically. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle and Joanna, for joining us today. Uh, this was a wonderful conversation. I think uh, in order to be able to actually think through the question of automation, we have to basically start thinking about not only how it is justified in this present moment, but also start thinking about the long history of it. Uh, because these systems do not come out of nowhere. They actually emerge out of this long, longer history of thinking about how these technologies are being built. They're built on data sets that are historical in nature and to a certain extent also uh, produce the kind of biases that we have already always been aware of as being a part of the way in which governance has worked out in one way or the other in a variety of different nation states. So this is not just a problem which is uh, particularly centered on how these technologies are being appropriated in countries which have a lot of data, it's also a problem in countries where you know they're still building the kind of data sets that are required in order for automation to work in the first place. And that to a certain extent uh, allows us to start thinking a lot more about questions of what are the ways in which this is implemented? How do we actually start uh, thinking about how, uh, how these experiences could potentially be categorized as a typology of harms? And then where do people actually go for due process and justice in these particular moments? And one of the major takeaways uh, from this conversation is also the fact that if we are ending up in a court of law in order to basically get justice, 
we've, we have already failed uh, in the context of how the harm has happened and how automation has caused the kind of issues that people have dealt with in their everyday lives over the span of years to be able to then you know, get justice. So on that note, I think uh, I would like to thank both you, Michelle and Joanna for joining us uh, for this wonderful conversation. I am really happy that we were able to have it. And uh, as Michelle put it right before the conversation began, it's going to be really depressing, but it's also very important. And I think on that note, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us, uh, all of you. And I wish we had more time. Thank well. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Do stay tuned on our website. Follow this, the series Conversations on the Datafied State. There will be so many resources being posted at the end of the series. Uh, and stay tuned with uh, all of our speakers' works and definitely follow the conversation online at datasociety.net. Have a wonderful day. Bye.